know, one of the things that I've shared before that when I look at God's Word, and one of the things I've really been pursuing God on lately is when I see God's Word saying something, and I know that it's true, and I don't see it manifesting in people's lives like it should, then that really drives me to dig into God's Word. And that drives me to seek God, to get understanding, God, why is that? So that then I can understand that, and then I can stand up and teach you how to make it work in your life better. And that's probably been one of the characteristics of me. Most of my uh, Christian walk, most of the time that I've been preaching and teaching, especially since I began to, you know, when I first was started ministering, it was basically just an evangelistic type of ministry. And, and uh, I, you know, shared uh, salvation message, so on and so forth. And then over the years, and you become more of a teacher, I guess, in some respects. But one of the things that has driven me in those times is to understand things, why things don't work. And sometimes Christians don't like to look at those issues. They just want to, you know, just kind of pretend like everything's okay. But there's times when we pray for things and we turn to God for things that we know the word promises and we don't see them manifest in our lives. And that's what I want to address tonight. And I'm going to address two areas that are extremely simple. But I personally believe the Lord has shown me this is really key areas where we mess it with God. Uh, I'm going to begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7. Very short verse. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, you may say, boy, that, that's very simple. We know that. You're going to tell us not to walk by sight, but to walk by faith. No, I'm going to deal with do we understand faith. And is there areas that we're misunderstanding faith? Is there areas that we're misunderstanding what faith is? Uh, but first of all, it says walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, that word walk there means the whole round of activities of the individual's life whether of the unregenerate or the believer. We might use a phrase today in more up-to-date uh, terminology. We might say that our lifestyle is a lifestyle of faith, not of sight. You might say that a Christian is to live a lifestyle, and the lifestyle that that Christian lives should be a lifestyle of faith and not by sight. Uh, so it's talking about the entirety of our life. <laughs> Key phrase there, by faith, not by sight. The classic example from the scripture that's used on that is there was a gentleman in the Bible called Thomas. We've given him a nickname over the years. We refer to him as Doubting Thomas. There's a reason that we say that because Thomas was not going to accept that Christ was resurrected unless he understood it by sight. You know, unless, unless I could touch the, the, his hand to feel the print of the nails, unless I could, could, could see the pierce in his side, then I'm not going to accept him. So Jesus later came to him and gave him that opportunity and said, you know, blessed are those who believe who, who have not had this experience, who have not seen. The other one we use to contrast that is Abraham. We know that Abraham gave birth to a child miraculously, as, a, as a, an elderly man, like a hundred years old, to a wife who was barren all of her life. And it says that he did not consider the age of his body, nor did he consider the barrenness of Sarah's womb, but he locked in to the promise of God's word. So we see there that Thomas was walking by sight. We see that Abraham was walking by faith. And so that is the great example that we often use for that. So we're going to not necessarily deal with those two yet, but I want you to go to the book of Ephesians, and I want to talk about something else real quick. But keep those two issues in mind because we will come back to them. And you're going to have to pay attention to me tonight because I'm going to build a couple points, and if you fall out somewhere, you may get lost. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without 
God in the world. So according to this verse here, it's talking about a people who have no hope because they are without God in the world. Now, let's think about this for just a second. Now, we might refer to people as having no hope. But if, if you look at it in a normal sense, many people would say, well, wait a second, I've got some hope. I hope that the next president will make things better. I hope that I get a new job and I'll do better then. I hope that when I get my degree in school, I'll be able to get another job that's going to pay me a lot better. I, I hope that my sports team will win the Super Bowl this year. I hope that my baseball team will win the World Series next year. I hope that the economy will turn around. I hope that my spouse will start acting better. I hope that my kids will call me. I mean, the world would say, wait a second, we have all kinds of hopes. What are you talking about? That just because we're without God, we have no hope. So apparently this verse here, this scripture here, is talking about a different type of hope than we refer to in a worldly sense. Apparently it's referring to a hope that is more of a heavenly hope. Something that comes and generates from heaven and gives a hope to us. Now those who are without Christ obviously couldn't have that hope. But I want us to look at a couple of scriptures real quickly here dealing with hope. Go to Romans chapter 4. We're all paying attention tonight. This is like math class. You've got to get one point and get to the next. If you get lost, you won't be able to solve the problem at the end. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. This is talking about Abraham in the example that I just referred to. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Who against hope believed in hope. Another way of putting it, who against hope believed in a heavenly hope. When there was no reason for an earthly hope, he had a heavenly hope. There was no reason, the Amplified says, for him to have a human hope. But yet, even though there was no reason for Abraham at that age, and Sarah being better to have hope, he had hope. Why? Because he had a hope that is different than you and I think of. In the natural sense, there would be no reason to look at Abraham and Sarah and to anticipate that they were going to give birth to a child. I mean, he was too old, and she was not only elderly, but she had been barren the entire of her life. She had never been able to give birth to a child, and now at this point in life, at this age, they're talking about having a child. In the human sense, there's no reason for hope. But even though there was absolutely no reason for hope, Abraham had hope. Now that seems like that don't hardly make sense. That, that, that how can somebody who have no reason for hope to have a hope? Let me give you an example here. Imagine that Joe Smith goes to the doctor. When he goes into the doctor, he gets some test ran. And he goes back three days later, and the doctor says, you know, I've got some terrible loans for you, Joe. You have a disease, and there's no known treatment for it. There's absolutely nothing we can do. All we can do is try to make you comfortable for the next few weeks while you pass away. There's no human treatment whatsoever for this disease. Joe says, wow. And he walks out of the doctor's office and he's, he's just all shook up and he said, well, wait a second. I, I know a church, they, they preach about God being a healer. And they teach us that God's a healer. And I know in the Bible, I, I've read those examples where Jesus healed those people. Now, wait a second. I, I remember I've heard a testimony, those people that came by the church and testified about that miraculous healing that took place in one of their lives. Then there was something that's happening. Now, all of a sudden, he's saying, yeah, wait a second. That's right. I remember all those years hearing that preacher teach about healing and saying that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. So I do have hope. So now that Joe Smith has a hope. So that's all good and great, isn't it? So praise God, Joe Smith has got hope. He's all right, isn't he? 
No, Joe Smith is getting ready to die in a few weeks. Because the Bible has never said anything about God answering the prayer of hope. He's got hope and that's great. He knows what the Bible says. He knows that the Bible's true. He's heard testimonies of what Jesus can do. He's heard sermons preached about it. He has a hope because he knows that's true. But the Bible doesn't say anything about the prayer of the of hope saving the sick. It's great he has hope. It's great he's at that place. You see, beloved, what I propose to you tonight, that's where so many Christians are. And they take a step of hope rather than a step of faith. They have a hope because they have knowledge in their head about what the Bible says. They have a hope because they heard sermons about what the Bible says. They have a hope because they have heard testimonies of people being healed. And so because they have hope, because they have heavenly hope, they think all is well. And they come to church and they give the altar call and they come up for prayer and they pray for them. They, you believe God healed you? I sure hope so. Now that sounds funny, but that beloved, I'm convinced that's where a lot of people are functioning at. And where a lot of people are operating at. And a lot of people don't really understand the difference between hope and faith. Because you know what the Bible says gives you hope. Because you've heard of testimonies gives you hope. Because you heard sermons, you have hope. But the dangerous thing is, is that people take a step of hope. And God doesn't answer the prayer of hope. And something then happens. They get very discouraged. They get very disappointed. And the next thing you know, that person is falling out. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. The Bible teaches us that you hear me refer to the parable of the sower quite often. And in the parable of the sower, we know that the sower goes forth and sows the word. And, and some people, you know, the, the devil will come down and just swoops it out of their life instantly. Just takes the word away. Some people receive it with gladness. And, and then the cares of this world and the persecution and the tribulation and all those things come along. And it doesn't endure. And one of the things we will see happen in, in so many people's lives, beloved, when people come to Christ and begin to walk with God and, and they begin to hear a message promising them great things of God and they don't see it manifest in their life, then immediately they begin to pack away. So what I'm sharing with you tonight is two of the key reasons why that happens and why that takes place. You have to have hope. But hope in and of itself does not receive anything from God. I hope so. Never receives anything from God. Now one time when Jesus turned around and somebody was healed and said, according to your hope, you're healed. Every time he said, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Will's are spent here by looking at If you go and minister to people, one thing you will experience if you go and pray for people, especially we, we use healing as an example tonight. You go and pray for people for healing. There's time that you'll go pray for people for healing. So you go to the hospital, you pray for somebody, and you walk out of there, and you realize nothing was accomplished. I mean, you went to that person, you prayed for that person, you know, a classic example, and I use this because honestly it happens quite often. You go in, you talk to them, and you pray for this individual. Oh, praise God, glory to God. You share a little bit with them for the word of God. You share a little bit about healing, maybe. And, oh, woo! You go and you pray.
pray for that individual and do what he did to start planting a few more. In all seriousness. Well, why did we pray for them to be healed and start planting the funeral? And you realize, not only do they not have faith that they were healed, but they really don't even have any hope that they could be healed. They agree with you because that's the thing to do. Agree with the pastor, be polite, and so on and so forth. But you realize that in their heart, they don't even really have any hope that that person's ever going to be healed. And that person doesn't really have any hope that they're ever going to be healed. They have just totally accepted the diagnosis. That person, the doctor said they're going to pass away soon. They've accepted that fact. There's nothing anybody can do about it. That's that. It's a done deal. No hope. You see, hope's important. Hope's important. You have to start with hope. If there's no hope, there'll never be anything. That person will never there who's sitting there with no hope, that family who's sitting there with no hope will never do what is necessary for them to get to the place where they have faith for that person to be healed. Hope is important. Hope is the anchor in the times of trial. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Just 
couple. I hope God moves. I hope God heals me. I hope God provides for me. I hope God does this. I hope God does that. That's a good place to start. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Now, let me explain to you the difference between hope and faith. Hope accepts this as the word of God. Hope accepts this as true. Hope accepts the fact that Jesus heals the sick. Faith says, I'm here. Be personal. See, I can have hope and salvation. I mean, there was probably a time in my life, I'm sure, when the, and I know, there, I know there was, where I had hope that I could be saved. I had heard the gospel. I would heard about Jesus. I knew in the back of my mind it was true, but I wasn't saved. I knew that there were people who were saved. I knew a few, two or three. Didn't doubt they were saved. And then you say, is it hopeless for you, Mike, that you'll never be saved? I said, of course it's not hopeless. I had hope. But I wasn't saved. Until it became personal. Until I placed my faith in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then I was saved. See the difference? There's a difference between hoping that someday I will be saved and knowing that I am saved. There's a difference between hoping someday I will be healed and knowing I am healed. Faith knows I'm healed. Faith knows I'm saved. Faith knows God's provided for me. Hope hopes it will. Romans 10, 17. It's going to be short and sweet tonight. So then faith Coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now let me explain to you, and I've taught on this before. We understand there's a difference between logos and rhema. Logos will give you hope. Rhema will give you faith. Let me explain it. Let me read a definition of rhema. That word there, let me read Jesus and we get to understand. So faith then cometh by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. That word's not used real often in the New Testament. If you do a word study, you'd be surprised how, how rarely the word rhema is mentioned. Generally speaking, when we say word or Bible or scripture, we're hearing logos. This is logos. I have in my hand the logos of God. The word of God. Now there's a difference between the logos of God and the rhema of God that brings faith. Logos will give me hope. Rhema will give me faith. I say, what are you talking about? That which is spoken, what is uttered in speech or writing, references not to the whole Bible as such, but to individual scripture which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for use in time of need. A prerequisite being the regular storing of the word inside of us. I, the definition I've always liked is rhema is a specific word to a specific person in a specific situation. It's not long ago. The general knowledge of God's word will give you hope. When the Holy Spirit applies the word of God to you in your situation, you have faith. You see the difference? I can stand up here today and, and many say, yeah, the word of God said that by his stripes we are healed. And everybody said, yep, yeah, that's what the Bible says. And sit there and not be healed. But when the Holy Spirit speaks in your heart, says, by his stripes you are healed. And he's talking to us, oh, glory to God, I'm healed. That's the difference between Logos and Rhema. One produces hope. The other produces faith. Go to Luke chapter 1. And the reason I do this because actually Gina mentioned this in an interpretation this evening. 
I found it kind of unique. And I'm going to read you two verses, Luke chapter 1, verses 37 and 38. Luke chapter 1, verses 37 and 38. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. <laughs> now that is really, there's not a lot of times when I, I look at the translation of the King James and just really scratch my head. This is one of them. It's that verse. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Let me read the Amplified and explain to you why I scratch my head on that. For with God, nothing is ever impossible, and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. The exact Greek wording of that is no rhema from God shall be impossible to accomplish. But for some reason they've translated that, for with God nothing shall be impossible. So hear the word say, for with, with God there's no rhema from God that's impossible. And notice that the response what Mary said. And this is where the angels tell Mary about the birth of Christ. So we're in Christmas spirit here. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy rhema. So the angel is saying, For with God there's no rhema that's impossible. And Mary said, According to you be done unto me according to thy rhema. You see, there's a very distinct difference there. God is saying that when I give you rhema, that the power is in that rhema to accomplish it. When I give you rhema, the anointing is there to accomplish it. When I speak rhema to you, I'm coming with a plan and a purpose to accomplish that in your life. Mary, when thy angel comes and tells you you're going to give birth to a child as a virgin, the power in that rhema is there to bring it forth. There is nothing that's impossible that God can't do when rhema comes forth. See, there's a difference in that. Logos gets hope. Rhema gives faith. Peter and them was out fishing all night. Remember that? Jesus came to borrow the boat. And used it to teach. And then when he was done, he wanted to be nice. He, Peter, go out and cast out there to deep fish the boat. Well, Lord, we've toiled all night, but at your rhema, we will do that. And at the rhema, they went out and they cast down their nets, and the nets were overflowing. You see, there's time you've got to understand rhema as a, in contrast to logos. So we can understand whether or not we're stepping out in hope or we're stepping out in faith. You know, how about with this, Andy? Yeah, we'll get you going to do something after church. The Bible says that Peter walked on water. Let's go walk the water tonight. Right. Let's walk across the river. Okay. Yeah, I tried that once, but I died. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have rainbow on that. Now, for some reason, I, I'm just standing there, I, and I'll I, I, I be honest with you, I'm not going to walk on the river on logos. Now, I'm standing here, and God speaks to me and, says, and brings out through my spirit, and I've got to get across this body of water. And he said, and God said, Mike, I told Peter to come and walk on the water, and I'm telling you now to come and walk on the water. I've got some rain on, and I'm walking on water. But I can't take logos and try to walk on water. I'm going to sink. I can't go out here and walk around the city seven times and expect the walls to come down. That's logo. But God gave me rain and says, Mike, the same way that, the, that they march around Jericho, the same way Joshua did it, I want you to march around Pekin, and you're going to see the glory of God fall. Then I got rain and I'm going to march around the city seven times. Oh, yeah. I got faith there and I hope. See, hope is important, but we've got stuck there. And people are thinking hope is faith, and they're taking, stepping out and calling it faith, and it's hope. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hallelujah, we're going somewhere tonight. To the place of victory. Hope is good. You have to have hope. That man who, who I used as an illustration, the doctor gave him, said there's nothing we can do. Walked out of the doctor's office, starts thinking right, thinking, well, wait a second, the Bible talks about healing, the Bible's got 
got healing in it. I've heard those sermons. I've heard those testimonies. He's got hope. They say, now I need to get home and I need to find out what do I need to receive the healing like those people that testify. What do I need to do to receive the healing like those people in the scriptures and get home and get into the word of God and wait for some rainbow. When Raymond comes to him, it's like, well, the Bible says by his stripes we are healed. But when the Raymond comes and says, you are healed by my stripes, then he's got some substance to add to the hope. I didn't make that up. He was just the first one. Now faith is the substance of things hopeful. It started with hope. They got some faith. And now they've got some substance. And they've got some evidence of things not seen. That word substance right there is actually title deed. God has spoken to them and says, that is yours. Hallelujah. So what am I telling us? Don't try to receive from God on hope. You see, we have to position ourselves to receive right now. And hope will motivate us to do that. I mean, if you're truly sitting here and, and, and you know, we've been talking about healing, this applies to anything. I'm just using healing because it's, it's something that all of us have dealt with or do deal with or in some capacity. Uh, and, and, you know, you think, well, I, you know, Different things happen. People get afflictions and they just accept them. And then they have no hope. Well, this is the way I am. This is the way my mom was, the way my grandma was. I mean, my good people back five generations and all of us had this affliction. If God wants to heal me, he'll heal me. Now, let all. You know, that if you look at Jesus' ministry, not one time did Jesus walk up the hill to my James, I just want to heal you today, so I healed you. Never happened that way. You never walked anywhere, knocked somebody in the head, said, You're healed. <laughs> hey, wake up! You wake up! You're healed! No, according to your faith, been done unto you. That's what he was constantly saying. You see, beloved, we can position ourselves to be in the place to receive rhema and hope will motivate us to do that. But if we just accept this is our lot in life, we'll never receive rhema for it. <coughs> never. They think, well, I just I just did my affliction. Well, you know, this is just my poverty. Well, this is just who I am, this is what I am. You'll never receive rhema. Hope. Or rises up and say, wait a second. There's promises in God's word that I can be healed. And that can be me just as easily as it can be anybody else. I mean, the promises of God are for me. Every promise in his word for me. Every promise in his word for you. But it starts when you get that hope and think, wait a second. Let's get to God and find out from God what needs to be done here so I can see that manifest in my life. God, I need some rain on. You see, when you talk about seeking God, that's what you're talking about. You're seeking right when you're seeking to God to poof, speak into your situation. You're seeking God to bring the scripture alive. There's a, a story I used to. I read years ago, I mean, it's not a story, it's a true story, but I can't remember her name now, but she was a, a medical doctor, and she had basically stopped practicing medicine and started ministering. And she would have places where people would come who were sick, and she would teach them healing, and she would teach them things of faith, and she would teach them the things of God while they were there, until they were healed and they'd move on. And uh, there was one lady, and, and she was dealing kind of right along this line. And she told this lady, she said, the Bible says by his stripes you are healed. Well, I know, I know all of that. She said, I want you to just go off and not just say that. Just confess that. Just
Let's see by his stripes I'm healed. Okay, ladies all about you. By my his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. Kept doing it by his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. And it's been on, I don't know, for quite some time. And she kept having that the lady. Go ahead and keep saying, by his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. And one day all of a sudden this lady in the house and, her, and, and they did the account of it. And she thought, by his stripes I'm healed. And suddenly in an, in an instant, it, it totally, her tone totally changed. And she went from my stripes I'm healed. Oh, glory to God, by his stripes I am healed. By his stripes I am healed. And began to shout. And just moments after that, she was healed. What happened? It went from hope. She received some rhema. And it went to faith, and the healing was manifest. She had a hope where she wouldn't have been there. She had a hope where she wouldn't have been grudgingly at least going along with what she had been instructed to do. But as she was saying that one day, the Spirit of God came alive and spoke to her and said, By His stripes you are healed. And she realized that it was God, and she realized she was healed. But all the other time, the word was true. But she had hope. And then she received rainbow. And she had faith. And she was healed. Glory to God, Pastor Nine, we gotta do something. Take your hope. Get in the word. Take your hope. Get before God. Take your hope. Get into worship. Take your hope and start listening, listening for some rhema so you can have some faith. Because rhema brings faith. Logos brings hope. Logos brings hope. Rhema brings faith. As it happened with the kid. Let me continue here with one other area. You see, that revelation is what the enemy fights against so hard in our life. I mean, that's why Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel was praying for revelation from God, and and uh, the angel started breaking forth, and, and, and it took 21 days of him waiting before God before the answer came through. And he had to, the angel had to call for Michael the archangel to break through and get the answer to it. What was all of those demonic powers trying to stop that for? Because he realized when he receives revelation, when he receives rhema, with rhema comes faith, with rhema comes the breakthrough. And we find that all through the scripture. In the parable of the sower, when the word is sown, is when the enemy attacks. Right? So when the word is sold, the enemy attacks. And he attacks, he comes in and tries to scoop it up, and, and he attacks with the persecution, the tribulations, and the cares of this world. He's trying to destroy that word that's been sown in your heart so it don't become rhema, and it don't become faith, and you don't see the manifestation. The whole point of the parable of the sower and the strategies of the enemy is he's trying to stop us from the time we hear the word before we see manifestation. Amen? I mean, the whole Bible is full of those battles, isn't it? I mean, people who were doing the right thing and went through tremendous battles. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was thrown in the fire of furnace simply because they were to worship a false god. Daniel was thrown on the lion's den because he wouldn't stop praying. Paul and Silas were thrown into a prison and, and, and bound up and they began to praise God and worship God. Their crime was preaching the gospel. You see, beloved, that's when we talk about walking by faith and not by sight. We've got to understand the intensity of the battle. We've got to understand the dynamics of hope becoming faith and seeing the manifestation but we've also got to understand the battle that's taking place along the way. You with me so far tonight? Remember when Peter was walking on water? He had ran to dead me. And the storm rose up. As soon as he received rain, the oh, can I walk on water? The storm rose up. And immediately he took his eyes off of Jesus who had said, Come, and looked at the storm and began to sing. Now, I know none of you guys have been through that. You never had a time when you've heard from God, Woo, Lord, God, Jesus, hallelujah! And started to step out of faith and immediately the storm rose up against you. What do you do in such a time as that? 
Hebrews chapter 6. Let's go back there. I'm going to give you revelation tonight. Hallelujah. Don't settle for hope. Get in the Word. Get in the presence of God. Get in worship. Anticipate rain to come. And bring in faith. And when faith rises up, get ready for the battle. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. That tells us it's going to be a fight, doesn't it? So here's, here's the scripture, and I used to read this, and oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I mean, you know that patience is not one of my strong points in life. <laughs> if you don't understand that, ask my wife, he will assure yeah. you, I don't wait. I don't wait for people. That's right. We're in covenant, so I have to wait for her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I do wait for God. <laughs> but notice this, Hebrews 6, 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So when you did tell me they got hope, and now we got rhema, and now I got to have patience. Glory to God. I can't even shout on that one. <laughs> I used to, here's, here's how I used to understand patience. And that's not what this means here is biblical at all. I used to think patience meant that I could go and sit and wait for somebody to pull my thumbs and be really happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be patient. I could just wait for a long time and be very content about it. I thought, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Joy 
of the Lord is our strength. And if I got some hope, and I'm getting before God, and God speaks some rain to me, I got some faith, and I start that faith walk, and every demon in hell comes against me, every problem you can imagine comes against me, but I'm walking in the joy of the Lord, I'm praising Him, and I'm rejoicing each and every step of the way. There ain't nothing in the world He can do to bring me down, because I'm not getting discouraged, I'm not getting frustrated, I'm not getting disappointed, and the joy that I have alive on the inside of me has nothing to do with what He's doing to me. The joy that I have has to do with my walk with Him. It has to do with the presence of the Lord. It has to do with the Word of God. And beloved, if you ever want to look at something that just lights you up a little bit, you just understand the fruit of the Spirit in this walk of faith. You understand that love is the power on the inside of you. The peace of the Holy Ghost is being manifested inside of you. The joy of the Lord is inside of you. How can the devil bring you down when you're walking in the joy of the Lord and the peace of Almighty God? When the fruit of the Spirit is being manifested, how can he possibly bring you down? Hallelujah. What can he possibly do? The joy of the Lord is my strength in the heat of the faith walk, in the heat of the battle. It's the joy of the Lord. As I was looking at that, I could picture the Apostle Paul sitting in a jail cell at Philippi, and there he is bound up, and people said, what are we doing? He said, rejoice, rejoice, I say to you, rejoice forevermore. Why? Because he understood the joy of the Lord was his strength. Hallelujah! How can I be patient? The joy of the Lord is your strength. How can I be the same? The joy of the Lord is your strength. How can I walk out by faith? The joy of the Lord is your strength. How can I keep from getting weary when the battle's on? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah! So I got hope. I'm going to get before God and get some rainbow and walk it out in joy. What can the devil do with that? How can he touch you? There's nothing that can take the joy away because Jesus is talking about the joy says that shall remain in you. How can he touch that? You see, that's the key to Nehemiah 8 10. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Why? Because the enemy can't touch it. And he can't defeat us. And he can't rob our joy. And the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. When I'm walking out that battle, how do I remain constant? I'm in his presence. It doesn't change. I'm walking out that, that, that battle. How, 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 how do I remain constant? Because when it talks about Jeremiah eating the word, it produced joy inside of him. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, I bring joy. Because his word is the same. How, how can I walk it out? Because the Holy Spirit on the inside of me bears fruit, and one of them is joy. And Paul can have joy in a jail cell. Paul and Silas can have joy in worship and praise it while they're bound up. Hallelujah! Lord, give him joy! Well, you guys are really thick and deep, aren't you? <laughs> That's too much too quick, huh? Slow down! Hear what I'm teaching you tonight. Hope is important. It's not enough. It's not enough. It's an anchor. Hope must have some substance. And the substance of hope is faith. And we have to walk out that walk with patience or remaining constant and remaining the same. And the way we do that is by walking in the joy of the Lord. That's 50 years worth of teaching. <laughs> and one half hour. You realize how important that is? To understand that? And, and don't answer me. I just not made a question for answers. But in all seriousness, go home tonight and ask yourself the question. 
How many things have you seen not manifest in your life in that teaching answers? How many things have you hoped would happen but you've never seen the manifestation? Because you've never pursued God to receive rain. And how many times have you received rhema that you fell out because you weren't walking in the joy of the Lord? I bet you got a list like I do. And I bet it's a long one. It's too long for Santa Claus. <laughs> you realize what this simple teaching what we can do with this? Take those things you're hoping for and pursue rain and walk it out of the world until you see manifestation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come joyfully to the keyboard.